Okay, thank you all for joining us this evening for tonight's webinar entitled Top Investment Mistakes to Avoid in the Next 6 to 12 Months. My name is Jason Doss, and I'm the moderator of tonight's event. I'm an Atlanta-based attorney with the Doss Firm, and for the last 18 years or so, my practice has focused on representing individual investment investors nationwide to try and recover investment losses resulting from investment fraud and bad investment advice and recommendations. I'm the president of the Piaba Foundation, which is a nonprofit organization devoted to preventing investment abuse through investor education. I am also the current president of the Alliance for Investor Education, also known as AIE. Uh, AIE was founded in 1996, and our organization provides investors with access to a full range of information they need to make wise investments decisions. We are also dedicated to working with our members, most of whom are all participating, or many of whom are participating as speakers on tonight's panel, to collaborate on joint investor education projects, such as tonight's event, because we believe that when we all work together, we all create investor educational material that's the highest quality and most effective. I wanna thank AAII for co-sponsoring this evening's, uh, this event tonight, and for, for, for providing access to their webinar platform. You may download the presentation, as well as some other investor educational materials, such as COVID-19, investor support research, resources, and the 10 best resources for understanding expenses and fees at AIE's website, investoreducation.org. You will also find all three of the PDFs available to download here within the GoToWebinar dashboard. And you may also follow AIE on social media and use the hashtag, hashtag AIE Town Hall when posting about this webinar. Finally, tonight's event has a great panel of experts and they have great information to provide you. Our speakers include Anna Ratner with the CFP board, uh, Kathy Stokes with AARP and its Fraud Watch Network, uh, Charles Rothbluck uh, with AAII, Robert Stammers with the CFA Institute, and Tina Kilroy with the ICI Education Foundation. As the title of our event suggests, our panel is going to discuss mistakes to avoid in the next six to 12 months. What's especially great about our presentation tonight is that each of our speakers addresses their topics from different perspectives. And our hope is that hearing their different messages in a single event will result in a very rich and entertaining presentation. Uh, during their presentations, you can send in your questions and I will ask those questions to the panel members during the second half of tonight's event. So, Without further ado, let me introduce our first speaker, Anna Ratner, with the CFP Board. Anna Ratner serves as Public Policy Counsel at CFP Board, which is a nonprofit that serves the public by fostering professional standards in personal finance, financial planning. As part of this role, Anna advises on the importance of the fiduciary standard in providing financial advice to, con to consumers and analyzes rulemaking and legislation at the federal and state levels. Before joining the CFP board, Anna worked for a boutique securities law firm in at FINRA in their market manipulation investigations department. So I'll start with a question to Anna, and then she can uh, answer it and make her presentation. Anna, um, since so many invest individual investors entrust financial professionals to manage investments and retirement savings, what are some tips that investors could follow in selecting a financial professional? Thank you, Jason, and good evening, everyone. I'd say that two tips for uh, investors selecting a financial professional are number one, awareness of the fiduciary concept, and number two, knowing the right questions to ask their FA. Uh, now, I understand that a significant part of today's presentation will focus on avoiding more blatant instances of investment fraud uh, but I wanted to talk about another practice that is less obvious but still dangerous, and that is when your invested assets are slowly eroded over time by conflicted advice. I want to emphasize that if you do, if you choose to work with a financial advisor, there's no such thing as a conflict-free relationship. Every financial professional has conflicts. 
However, choosing to work with a fiduciary advisor may help reduce the impact of some of those conflicts. The crucial question then becomes, is your FA bound by ethical and legal standards to work in your interest at all times? So I just wanted to share some numbers with you and illustrate how American investors often view this topic, especially now during the pandemic. I understand that many in the audience are do-it-yourselfers, but COVID-19 and the volatility that it has introduced in the markets seem to be rushing more investors and pushing them to seek advice. Uh, for example, in a survey conducted only last month, CFP board found that 64% of its certificates agree that more Americans will seek professional financial advice in the wake of this pandemic. And 34% of the certificates already reported an increase in inquiries from prospective clients. At the same time, a great majority of Americans believe that FAs should legally be required to put clients' interests first, and about half mistakenly believe that FAs are already, already legally required to do so. So there is a lot of misconception around the fiduciary concept. Um, and some investors aren't sure what they pay in interest fees or in investment fees, let alone if they pay any. Yet these fees and the related conflicts absolutely matter. It has been shown that hidden fees can add up to more than $400,000 in an investor's lifetime. So where does this leave us? Um, it was against this backdrop that CFP board came up with a revised code of ethics and standards of conduct. Uh, this set of rules became effective in October of last year and will start to be enforced on June 30th of this year. Uh, we believe that the revised code and standards includes a true fiduciary duty. Uh, but the fiduciary duty is nothing new to CFP board. Uh, we first introduced the fiduciary duty in 2007, and the revised code and standards builds and expands upon that. Under the code and standards, CFP professionals must act as a fiduciary at all times when providing financial advice, which is interpreted broadly to include more than just financial planning. This text is pulled directly from the code and standards. And here you can see that the fiduciary duty is the first duty owed to clients under A1. And I want to highlight three key aspects of uh, this duty. And the first is the duty of loyalty, and that requires a CFP professional to put his client's interests above those of his own and his firm and he or she must do so without regard to any compensation that they are to receive. The second is the duty of care, which requires the CFP professional to act with care, skill, prudence, and diligence when making recommendations, um, and also align those with the client profile, uh, risk profile, background, and objectives. And the third one is avoiding conflicts. Um, and if those cannot be avoided, fully disclosing material conflicts of interest, obtaining informed consent from the client, and properly managing them. So that is our fiduciary duty in a nutshell. This is all available publicly on our website if you want to learn more. Which brings us to the next slide and where this all leaves us. Um, if you are choosing to work with an FA, make sure that you keep some of these concepts in the back of your mind and don't be afraid to ask the important questions. Uh, the two most important ones I'd say are, are you a fiduciary at all times in our relationship? And what are your conflicts of interest and how do you address them? Two very short questions that provide a wealth of information and can change the trajectory of your investments. And with that, I am happy to take any questions at the end of everyone's presentations. Anna. Thank you so much, Anna. Um, our next speaker tonight is Kathy Stokes with AARP. Uh, Kathy is the director of the Fraud Prevention Programs at AARP and leads the AARP's Fraud Watch Network. Prior to joining AARP in 2016, Kathy ran her own communication consulting practice for about a decade, focusing on consumer education around uh, retirement planning. She was on the maiden team of the Retirement Security Project at the Brookings Institute after nearly a decade with Ernst & Young. Kathy started her career in retirement education and financial literacy with the Employee Benefit Research Institute. She has a BA in rhetoric and communication 
from the University of Pittsburgh and a master's in American government from John Hopkins University. Um, Kathy, obviously the current COVID-19 pandemic has introduced a lot of uncertainty when it comes to investments. Since you lead the AARP Fraud Watch Network, what trends in investment fraud and abuse are you seeing right now? And do you have any tips uh, for folks to avoid becoming a victim? Yeah, for sure, Jason. Thank you. And thanks for having me. Um, you know, uh, scammers follow the headlines, uh, just like all of us do. Uh, and they're pretty adept at switching things up to uh, take advantage of every opportunity that comes its way. Uh, this pandemic um, is bringing them out in droves. Um, and before I get into that, I just want to give just a little bit of an overview of the AARP Fraud Watch Network. We sit in the social mission part of the AARP enterprise, and our goal is all about education because we've learned that if you know about a specific scam, you're going to hear about three or four of them tonight. If you know about that scam, you're 80% less likely to engage with it. And if you do engage, you're 40% less likely to lose money. So it's education first, last, and always. And we also have a part of our program where we provide help. If you do become a victim, or if you're just unsure about something, or you just you know, you, know, um, you just want to report that you've uh, you've seen something but haven't been victimized, we have a Fraud Watch Network helpline, and you don't have to be an AARP member or of a certain age um, to take advantage of that. So I uh, just wanted to put that out there and also say, like a lot of us don't think that we would ever fall victim to a scam. You know, we're all savvy, we're all smart, but you know what? All of us are targets. Uh, they'll go where the money is. Um, we are already in a heightened emotional state because of the pandemic and all of that that brings with it. And scammers' number one goal is to get you into a heightened emotional state because once you're there, you're no longer thinking logically and they can take great advantage. Well, since we're all in a heightened emotional state, job number one has already been done for them. So that's why we need to be especially vigilant um, and, and any kind of investment opportunity that, that comes our way. Um, so let me go on to talk about the investment scams. Um, COVID-19 uh, scams are prevalent. I'm sure you've heard of um, you know, fake cures and treatments and vaccines. And there are also companies that are saying that they are working on those things as an attempt to um, you know, uh, bring up their stock value. And the Securities and Exchange Commission has actually um, temporarily suspended uh, trading on at least a dozen public, publicly traded companies because of their unsubstantiated claims um, that they are working on treatment, vaccine, or cure. So uh, the federal regulators are taking all of this very seriously. So if you get something like an opportunity like this that comes your way, you know, just engage your inner skeptic and do your research. If the investment opportunity is something that you're pressured to take action on right away, consider that to be a real red flag. Any legitimate opportunity that's there today is going to be there tomorrow. So someone trying to pressure you into making a, a, a decision quickly is likely uh, trying to deceive you. Um, another type of fraud that we're seeing is, if you go back to the other screen, um, I wanna cover all the other um, scam types, thank you. High yield investment fraud. This is characterized by promises of high rates of return with little to no risk. And you're all investors out there, you know that investing comes with risk. It's just part and parcel to it. The investment could be in any variety of things. It could be in securities or real estate or gold coins, anything to pique your interest. And again, they're really convincing and will likely pressure you to make, uh, make a decision quickly. Um, they use a tactic that's called scarcity to make you think that this is a limited time offer. Everybody else is getting in on it and you need to act quickly. Big red flag. Then there's the pump and dump scheme. Um, in this, scammers will spread false or misleading information about uh, like a penny stock um, and try to create a buying frenzy to pump up the value of that stock. And then as soon as that gets up to a level they're comfortable with, they sell their stocks and run off. And then since they're not out you know, pushing it anymore, the value goes down and most of the investors will lose the money that they put into that. So that's a, a lovely one that we're expecting to see more of. Um, and then there's affinity fraud. This is when somebody ingratiates themselves into a community, say a church, religious group, 
um, maybe makes a friend with one of those uh, members of a church, um, ends up, you know, convincing him or her that he's an investment professional and can make them a lot of money. And then he shows how the money is making money and it's all deceptive. And then he gets her to invite all of her friends to come and talk to him. And then he ends up getting a bunch more clients, um, shows, you know, it's a Ponzi scheme, uh, shows all these amazing returns and then disappears with people's money. So those are the kind of things that I would think um, we would need to look out for. And if we go to the next slide now, we can talk about the common element of all of these fraud schemes. And it's that you're gonna lose most or all of your money. So that's why it's really important to be aware of them. And when you talk to your other friends as investors, if you hear about an investment scam, let them know too, because chances are you're not listening to the same station, so to speak. Um, so it's really important to spread the message about how these scams work so people can spot them and avoid them. Any investment opportunity that sounds too good to be true probably is. It's a good sort of general rule to follow. Um, any guarantee of high risk or high return and no risk is just a flat out lie. Uh, any pressure to act right away, as I mentioned before, this is a huge red flag. And the old, everybody is buying it, um, the pitch often adds pressure um, by saying you have to get in on it because everybody else is. So if we can switch over to prevention. Um, so to prevent losing money in an investment scam, always be wary of unsolicited offers. Robocalls are at an all-time high. Let your answering machine or your voicemail pick up all the calls that are coming in where you absolutely don't know who that person is. You know, pick up for the, for the friends and the family, but let everything else go to voicemail your answering machine, listen to the pitch, the offer, the um, whatever the message is with intent. Does this sound legitimate? Should I call back? And you know, nine times out of 10, you're probably gonna make the decision that it was uh, a robocall and a scam uh, and you'll want to avoid it. You also wanna ask questions. If someone's trying to push you in on an investment, you ask, why is this investment suitable for me? How specifically will this investment make money? And what are the fees to buy it, to maintain it, and to sell the investment? And also, always do your research. Um, investment professionals and investment products are searchable, uh, and there are a bunch of different ways to do it. Uh, federal agencies have lots of great tools. Um, the Securities and Exchange Commission has investor.gov, great educational information and um, ways to look up products. Um, broker check on the FINRA website is really helpful. Um, the Commodity Futures Trading Commission also has a, a, a page that uh, you can do some lookups. And then the North American uh, Securities Administrators Association does as well. So take advantage of the opportunities, slow it down, um, be very concerted in your decision making. Don't let somebody you know, sort of bully you into making a fast decision and keep yourself informed. Um, if you uh, are interested in learning more about scams and fraud more broadly, I would uh, love you to visit our webpage at aarp.org slash fraud watch network. And now I'll send it back over to Jason. All right, thank you so much, Kathy. Um, just to, as a quick update, we have just under a thousand attendees uh, listening to this, which is amazing. Uh, please post your questions within the, the question panel of the dashboard. If you have a question for a specific panelist, please indicate that when submitting it. Don't be bashful. Go ahead. Even my mom, by the way, is on this call. So um, that is something special. Um, so the next speaker uh, is Charles Rochblatt. Uh Charles is the Vice President and Financial Analyst at AAII. He is the editor of the AAII Journal created VMQ Stocks, co-created AAII Dividend Investing, helps to manage the SOX Superstars Report Portfolio, and authors the weekly AAII Investor Update email. Charles regu regularly speaks to the media and is a Wall Street Journal expert panelist. His book, Better Good Than Lucky, How Savvy Investors Create Fortune with the Risk-Reward Ratio, was published in November 2010. Uh, Charles, my question for you is, you are a believer in rules-based approaches to investing. Could you please explain why you think this is important 
uh, and offer maybe an example. Sure, absolutely. So all of our portfolios here at AI are, man are managed by rules. And the reason why we're big believers in rules is they take the emotional component out of your investing decisions. If we go back to March, where the country was shutting down, a lot of people were wondering what to do with your portfolio. And we believe that if you have a rules-based approach, you have something to fall back on, and it gives you a sense of control. It gives you a, a path forward when things seem uncertain, and there's a lot of fog in terms of the outlook. And what you're seeing in front of me is a chart, and it's showing three portfolios. All started out as a diversified portfolio of 70% stocks, 30% bonds. And I assumed in this scenario, an investor started in January 2000. Hard to pick a worse time to start investing over the last 20 years because this investor started right before the dot-com bubble burst, would have stayed you know, exposed to stocks during the financial crisis, and of course, more recently toward with the COVID pandemic. And I assumed one of three things. A, the investor just did nothing, let his portfolio ride, I assume the investor rebalanced periodically. And then I had a third scenario, which I call the panic scenario. And that assumed the investor got out of the market whenever the S&P 500 fell by more than 20% in a calendar year. So in this scenario, I assume the investor got out of the market at the end of 2002, the end of 2008. And I conservatively assume the investor stayed out of the market for one year. And I say conservatively because when people panic, they really want to wait for the all clear sign to get back into stocks. And they usually don't see that until the market has rallied by considerable amounts. We see this right now. You know, we can go back to March. We saw the market's bottom. States were still shutting down. The curve in the United States was still trending up. More and more coronavirus cases, more and more coronavirus uh, diagnoses and deaths. But we've seen the market rally on hopes that the economy will rebound, that once we get through the second quarter, hopefully we'll see improving economic numbers. Now, will we? I don't know. We're seeing a lot of descriptions for what the economic recovery will look like, whether it'll be a straight up, whether it'll be a W, a U, we don't know. But what we do know is that there is a benefit to just staying invested and riding through it. And it is hard for investors to do this because our brains predate the financial markets. As you go to the next slide, what you'll see here is when we look at the history of humankind and the history of the financial markets, there's a huge disconnect. The first financial crisis in modern history, the tulip bubble crisis in Holland, that was about 400 years ago. The NYSE, it's a little over 200 years old. We can go to Charles Schwab, the first discount broker. That was started in the 1970s. But when we look over the course of human history, the first known sign of human civilization, that was 12,000 years ago. And humankind was on this planet long before that, which means our minds emerged to do, our minds evolved to deal with a very different environment than we deal, in, than we deal with right now. If we go back and look at ancient man, he wasn't worried about what the president was saying on Twitter. He wasn't worried about what Jerome Powell was going to do with interest rates. He wasn't worried about what, say, Jim Cramer was saying on CNBC. He was concerned with more basic things. He was concerned about food, water, shelter. Will I survive to the next day? So we really evolved with this flight our fight response, and when we saw crises, we reacted quickly because ancient man, if he stopped to analyze the situation, he probably would have been killed. So this worked really good for survival, but it's downright awful if you're trying to manage a portfolio. So what's the solution? Well, it turns out the simplest things work really well. There's a long story about Van Halen, the rock band, wanting to have a clause in our contract that said no green M&Ms in their candy dish. And that sounds kind of funny, but the reason why they did it is they figured out that if they wrote that into the contract and a concert venue didn't take out all their green M&Ms, it was assigned to the band and to their staff to go through all the electronics, all the stage setup, and see what else 
got messed? What else got messed up in their in their concert gear and that could cause potential problems and even safety issues? So what kind of solutions as an investor would work well for you? Well, one of the things is simply having a checklist, something that guides all your buy and sell decisions. Walking through each of those steps will take the emotional component out of your decisions and might prompt you to look at something you might have missed. Automation. Richard Thaler, the Nobel Prize winner, is famous for saying he's made a career out of being lazy. But if you think about some of the things that work really well as an investor, automating your required minimum withdrawals if you're a retiree, automating your contributions to your 401k savings if you're a worker, those that automating your savings, having money go out of your paycheck every pay period and go automatically into your IRA, automatically into your savings accounts. We humans tend to depend a lot on inertia. So once you get those things set up, you're probably not going to change them, but, but yet by having those automatically deposited in your accounts and having automatic investments set up so the money automatically gets put to work for you, you're not likely going to change it. So even when the market goes down, you'll start taking advantage of the dollar cost averaging and having those things work for you. You can also automate your dividend reinvestments. And the other thing is, on top of the automation, it's simply having these rules, having a plan governing your investing decisions, a plan you can fall back on so when things get uncertain, you can fall back on this and say, well, what should my plan be? So if you're an investor right now saying, Charles, it's great, but I'm worried about what the economy is going to do. I'm worried about the virus. I'm wondering if now's a good time to get back into the market. I would say stop and just consider this five-step process that we're actually working on here at AI, AAII, a new project we're calling the AAI Way. It's our code name. It's really five simple things. Defining your goals. What are you saving for? Why is money important? What are your goals? And then once you understand what your goals are, then pick an appropriate allocation. Don't think how much I should have for stocks. First, think about what do I need to fund? When do I need the money? And then figure out the right allocation for you. After that, then you can start identifying your investing preferences. Do I want to pick stocks? Do I want to work with a planner? Do I want to use funds? Do I want to be active? Those decisions come afterwards. And then only after you've made all those decisions, then you get to the point of choosing investments. And finally, going to that monitoring process. Is an investment monitoring your rules? And if your rules don't have sell when there's a pandemic going on, then you shouldn't sell when a pandemic occurs. Stick to those rules because those rules are designed to get you through a variety of markets. And the investors that tend to do the best tend to be the ones with the best behaviors, the ones that never panic, the ones that focus on those long-term goals of the investors who tend to survive the turbulent markets and the ones who tend to have returns far in excess of the average investor. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Charles. That was great. Um, now our next speaker is uh, Robert Stammers. Uh, Bob is with the CFA Institute. He's the Director of Investor Engagement on the Future of Finance team of, uh, for the CFA Institute. Prior to joining CFA, uh, Mr. Stammers was the principal for his found, founding company where that he founded, uh, where he consulted to aid real estate owners, lenders, syndicators, uh, and he developed and analyzed structured real estate investments. Um, Bob, what investing principles should investors consider during these uncertain times? Thanks, Jason. Um, I promise to answer your question in the body of my presentation, but first I want to highlight some of the content and the highlight principles that are important in market environments of all types. So CFA Institute is known, among other things, as the administrator of the CFA um, charter designation, which is a well-known industry credential for investment professionals like fund managers and investment advisors. At CFA Institute, we have content that helps people both save and invest. We concentrate on both saving and investing since you need to have capital to invest well. All of that is based on tried and true principles and best practices that savers and investors have used to achieve their financial goals. To give you some idea of our content, we have information similar to what Anna described earlier called the Statement of Investor Rights and Realize Your Rights to help you determine the ethical foundations 
of your financial service professionals and how to find the right fiduciary for you. We also have principles and best practices in retirement planning and how to build financial fitness. We have content that details the greatest investing mistakes and traps that investors often fall into. And we've recently created content that outlines the principles in both personal finance and investment management that are crucial for you to consider during this pandemic. So all of this content can be found at cfainstitute.org slash future finance. Or as Jason uh, mentioned earlier, some of it is available on the AIE website, which is investoreducation.org. So that brings me to my next slide. And I wanna talk a little bit about the processes necessary to achieve your financial goals. So there are two, pro two major processes. One is the accumulation of capital, which requires saving skills for you to you know, accumulate money so that you can invest. And then the other one is the utilization of capital or putting that capital into the market, which requires investment skills. Both are necessary to achieve financial goals. And the better you are at each one of these, the both of these processes, the greater the probability of reaching your financial goals. One mistake that I see investors make that I want to talk about is, that's really important in, this, in the current environment is not concentrating enough on your personal finance and savings skills. So many investors focus all their energies on the new investment strategy, the new company to invest in, you know, asset allocation and risk management strategies while totally ignoring how to optimize their saving and investing more capital, right? How do I save the most, optimize the money that I have to invest? The more money I have, even in bad markets, you're, you know, when you're, you know, buying low um, relative to, uh, you know, previous pricing, you have more money to put in the market and it grows. So the more, opt the more capital you can save and the more um, higher probability of reaching your financial goals. So I know that many people that make much more money than I do um, have their finances in tatters because they don't have those, those personal finance and saving skills. In fact, there are many millionaires in this country, some that may live next door to you, that became that way because they are so good at minimizing expenses, their debt management, and saving. And then what they say, what they save and don't spend, they invest that extra capital. So. Personal finance skills have always been important, but are even more important now to ensure ourselves against unexpected financial issues and situations like the pandemic that we find ourselves in today. So that brings me to the next slide, which is really just to highlight this content that we did around the pandemic. And I wanna just highlight that when we decided to create um, saving and investing principles for dealing with this pandemic, we created these two pieces of content shown here, which include principles for money management as well as for investment management. This is again to reiterate that it is just as important to focus on your spending, debt management and saving habits as it is to focus on what you can do with your investments. And that takes me to my final slide where, so from those previous documents, I picked out a few of what I think are the most important principles to be considering during this pandemic. And I don't have a lot of time to go through them in detail, so I'm just gonna hit the high points. So when it comes to your personal finances, develop detailed financial goals. If you don't have stated financial goals, there's a good probability that you will not reach them. So take a look at your goals and see how they may be affected by the current situation and modify your saving and investing plan appropriately. Having detailed goals will help you determine how much you need to save and invest each month to reach them. Track your spending. I found very few people that really track their spending well. Many people have lots of financial leakages and spend for things that are not needed that uses the capital they could have been using to invest more. Also, when you understand your spending well, you can quickly determine what can be taken out of the budget when you need to tighten your belt. Maintain a steady lifestyle. Probably the single most effective way to optimize your saving and investing by keeping your lifestyle relatively constant and putting salary increases, bonuses, and any unexpected windfalls into your saving and investing program. Ensure yourself of the unexpected. Keeping a liquid emergency fund of say six to nine months of household expenses 
and understanding what in your life you can do without will help insulate you from unexpected financial issues. Invest in yourself. Your greatest asset is your human capital, your ability to work and generate income. That if you focus on your health, your education, and have a passion for lifelong learning, you can increase your productivity and your human capital over time, which will allow you to save more and invest more. And then obtain knowledge and advice. If you're not confident in your personal finance skills, learn from financial education content from unbiased sources and find either a friend or a family member with the appropriate skills to help mentor you. So when it comes to investment management, some of the, some of the principles are similar. Um, first of all, review your financial plan. Charles talked about this before, the importance of having stated goals. And it's important to have that detailed plan because it'll keep you on track. And as a long-term investor, you shouldn't need to really change your plan often, really only until there's some type of life change or when low probability events like the, this pandemic occurs. Don't time the market. I've heard a lot of arguments about which, which is more important, asset allocation or what types of assets you invest in, or security selection is more important, which is the actual securities you decide to invest in. But I never hear people arguing that it's their ability to buy and sell at the optimal time that provides their return, because very few people can time the market effectively. Stop reacting to the media. Advisor, uh, advisors often tell investors not to panic and to make investment decisions when they're rational, which is much easier said than done. But it's impossible if you continue to react to the sensationalism prompted by the media. Once again, you know, insure yourself. Once again, an emergency fund of liquid assets will keep you from having to sell into a bad market and force you to make and force you not to make the cardinal sin of investing, which is to buy high and sell low. You know, people right now that don't have those liquid invest, those liquid assets, don't have an emergency fund. A lot of them are having to go into their 401k plans or divesting out of the market in a bad market because they need the capital. Review and understand your unique risk profile. Every investor has a financial ability to take risk and an emotional tolerance for it. You need to understand your unique risk profile and make sure that your investment portfolio does not cause you to lose sleep at night. Make sure to rebalance after a long bull and bear market and make sure you're comfortable with the investment risks you are taking. And once again, like in personal finance, obtain uh, knowledge and advice. An uncertain environment or the markets are volatile is a good time to seek the help of an accredited investment advisor. As Anna mentioned, look for a fiduciary like a CFP for your financial planning or a CFA charter holder to help you design and manage your investment portfolio. And before I end, one last point. Like training for a marathon, take the steps to build a saving and investment discipline. It isn't complex, but it does take continuous effort to hone the necessary skills and sometimes requires the right coach to help you perfect them. With that, I thank you and uh, turn it back over to Jason. Thank you so much, Bob. Um, okay, so our final speaker is Tina Kilroy. Uh, Tina is the Vice President of the ICI Education Foundation, uh, leading the efforts of the Investment Company Institute to develop and deepen investor education resources and partner with ICI members and other organizations to enhance financial literacy. ICI does extensive research on investment companies and investors. So my question for Tina is, Tina, can you talk more about what the ICI has seen in this research that can shed some light on investing through uh, times like this? This event together. Um, I think the interest in this webinar shows what people are worried about and what they're wondering about right now. Um, investing in volatile markets can be scary. And I think folks are facing really difficult financial decisions, both about their short-term needs and also their long-term goals. So the Investment Company Institute, ICI, represents mutual funds, ETFs, closed-end funds, 
that more than 100 million Americans rely on. So, so I bet um, most of the people participating in this webinar are shareholders in a fund whose interests ICI represents. ICI has a 40 member research staff that studies funds and their investors. So I'd like to share tonight some of that research um, that I think can be helpful for long-term investors to hear, especially right now. The S&P 500 dropped 20% in the first, the first quarter of this year. So these are uncertain times and I think we all crave certainty when things go a little haywire. What's gonna happen? How is this all gonna play out? So for the retirement savers that ICI studies, they're saying, what is gonna happen to my 401k balance? When am I gonna get back on track? So we obviously can't predict the future and I'm not gonna try to do that tonight, um, but we have all this data and it lets us see how long-term savers have fared through economic downturns in the past. So ICI looked at four 401k participants who were in the same plan consistently to get a good picture of their average account balance over the course of several years. So first looking at the tech bubble burst, the S&P 500 lost nearly 50%, um, but the average account balance um, for consistent participants dropped for two years, significantly less than 50%, um, and it recovered um, by the end of 2003. Then looking at the great financial crisis, the S&P 500 suffered even, big, even bigger losses um, during that time period. On the next slide there, we can see that. Um, and the average account balance of consistent participants fell by about 25% in 2008, but it had recovered by the end of 2009. So you have to keep in mind, of course, that 401k balances include contributions as well as market gains and losses. So for younger workers, their contribution makes a bigger impact on their account balance. For older workers, they have uh, their contributions make up a smaller part of their overall balance. But even when you look at only older workers in the database, the rebound followed the same pattern for them. So this study looked at 401k participants, but I think it has really important lessons for every long-term investor. Um, steady contributions, of course, are important, but so is diversification. It's difficult, if not impossible, to predict uh, investing winners from one year to the next. So holding investments that are less likely to react in the same way to economic or market conditions, doing that can blunt the losses to your portfolio. Portfolio, And on the flip side, diversification can also provide opportunities um, to greater rewards than you otherwise may have had with a more limited portfolio. So I think uh, for many investors, volatility and all that uncertainty that it can bring, that can definitely be one of the most unsettling realities of investing, but being diversified, taking appropriate risk, and being comfortable with that risk that you've taken on Doing all of those things will help you stick with your investing plan, even through all of the inevitable ups and downs of investing. So I know it can seem like a minefield with mistakes to be made everywhere, but I also think it can be an opportunity to make informed investing decisions and to take positive steps toward a better financial future. So I'm happy to take questions um, and back to you, Jason. Thank you. Okay, um, so now it's time for the question and answer session. Uh, don't forget, please post your questions within the question panel of the dashboard. Uh, if you have a question for a specific panelist, please indicate that when you're submitting. As I said before, we have just under a thousand attendees and there's a list of questions. I, I, I already sitting here in the queue. I'm doubtful we'll be able to get through all of them, so I apologize if I don't get to your question, but uh, I'll ask a couple first. Uh, the first two are directed to Anna with the CFP board. Anna, what are the ramifications to a CFP if they don't act according to the code of ethics and the standards of conduct? And then um, the second question to you, Anna, is uh, you recommended having a financial advisor you're considering do business with state that they're a fiduciary. Uh, is, there, um, is there a statement on the CFP website or other online resource that we can ask the financial advisor to sign that addresses this fiduciary relationship? 
Well, I'll handle the second question first. Um, what we have found is that we don't want them to just stay there a fiduciary. We want them to be a fiduciary. Um, and that means putting the client first and above them. Um, so if you look at our website, there are a lot of resources. Um, very few times do you find a client coming up to a financial advisor, a CFP professional or a CFA uh, a charter holder and saying, please sign this document that states you're a fiduciary. And, you know, then it um, uh, it's almost like a, a contract and then it gets into contract law. Um, but I, I would basically find almost no um, financial advisor that would seriously consider signing that. So make sure that they're a fiduciary. There's, you can always look at their form ADV uh, on how they charge. Um, you could always look at broker check and IAPD, the SEC, um, FINRA, and uh, other organizations. NASA has a lot of resources on this and really dig down deep to how they act, not just who they say or what they say they are. Um, and then the first question, if you could repeat that, please, Jason. For, for the first, sorry. The first question was, uh, what are the ramifications to a CFP if they don't act according to the Code of Ethics and Standards of Conduct? And I do wanna... Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, and I do want to thank you for that. And I want to emphasize that we have a, a disciplinary process that um, investigates and um, has uh, ramifications for CFP professionals uh, who violate our code and standards. And that could be, um, you know, a simple cautionary letter, or it could be basically stripping you of the right to use the CFP marks, uh, depending on the violation stated. Um, so there is a disciplinary process and um, the DEC, the Disciplinary Ethics Commission is actually headed by peers, other CFP professionals, and they are the ones that ultimately decide the fate of um, people who violate our code and standards. Great, thank you, Anna. Um, the next question uh, is actually for anyone who wants to chime in. I think it's a broad enough topic and very applicable to what's going on right now. Uh, the question relates to risk tolerance and the recommendation to stay the course. Um, most advisors and experts tell clients to stay the course during a downturn in a market. Uh, what is the relationship between risk tolerance in that recommendation to stay the course? When should you, uh, you know, stay the course and when should you trust your gut and, and, and maybe sell or what? Can you guys talk about that? And what should an investor do in that situation? I think it affects a lot of people. Yeah, I'll, I'll take that one, Jason. Um, I think, you know, you, it's very, very hard to generalize when it comes to investing. It's very unique to each person. That's what I was talking about before. You have to understand your own risk profile. You have to understand your financial ability to take it and your emotional ability to take it. And so a lot of uh, advisors are telling people to stay the course because they know eventually the, the market will return. I mean, it has, at least if the past is any predictor of the future, it has done that over time. So if you're a long-term investor, it usually make, makes sense to stay the course. Usually there's not a lot of reasons to change your financial plan unless you've had a change to your, you know, you know, you've gotten married, divorced, there's been some change to your life, or there's been some change to the environment, which what we are that's what we are in now. So really people have to make that decision for themselves on, you know, what, what they need the money for, what um, you know, what they are investing for, and whether they can still achieve their they think they still can achieve their financial goals by taking the risk that they're taking. It's once they have hit their profile, once it's gone above, what they think they can handle is when they start to th I need to think about taking either taking their money out of the market or taking some money out of the market, depending on what their financial needs are. Charles, do you have any um, Charles, do you have any thoughts about that as well? Yeah, I do. We've been talking about this at the office too. Uh, and I, one of the things about risk, you know, Bob was just talking about knowing your risk tolerance, and I think it's important to realize that if you assess your risk when the market's doing well and you assess it when the market's being very turbulent, 
you're going to have two different tolerances and you need to find that middle ground. Uh, but I think the other thing is to think about the timing of when do you need the cash. And really, it's your cash flow that should drive a lot of your allocation decisions. So if you don't need the cash for 15, 20 years, we're out the volatility. But if you know you have a big expenditure coming out, say, in two years, well, that money should not be in the market to begin with. So you really want to almost break down your goals and think about when is this goal going to occur? How much cash do I need relative to my portfolio? And then base your allocation from that standpoint. Uh, one of the things our founder suggested for retirees, and I, it was actually in today's Wall Street Journal where I talked about it, was if you're retired, have about up to four years of cash set aside. And then whenever the market's down, you have this cash bucket you can withdraw from. So you're not withdrawing from your stocks when the stock market's down. And if you know you have this cash bucket, it can actually provide a psychological buffer. But I think as Bob said, if you get to the point where you really just can't sleep at night, that's your mind saying you're taking too much risk on and you have to take that in consideration when the market rebounds and you feel like taking on more risk because the worst thing you can do is sell when the market's at the bottom if you're going to lock in those losses. So you have to realize that maybe your psychological tolerance could actually be lower than your financial tolerance. Great. Um, am I unmuted? Uh, all right. So the next question is for uh, Tina. Uh, Tina, and anyone else who wants to chime in as well. So the question is, what are the general merits between investing in mutual funds versus ETFs? What should investors consider when they're considering investing in those types of investments? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, you can all hear me, right? Yeah, okay. Um, I think it's a great question because um, they're similar products in some ways. They have really important differences that investors should understand. So a mutual fund holds a pooled um, um, basket of securities, just like an ETF, um, but they're priced differently. That's one of the key differences between them. So um, mutual funds are priced each day, at the end of the day, um, and you can buy them and sell them at that price. ETFs, however, um, are traded throughout the day. So you can buy and sell your ETFs on the secondary market all day long if you wanted to. Um, there are tax implications that you need to consider as well. Um, and I think it's important to think about um, how they would fit in your overall portfolio. What, again, like going back to what we've been talking about, what are you trying to achieve with your investments? Um, are you looking at long-term um, investments? Do you need access over the exchange um, for, to your ETF from the market? Um, so I think one of the most important things to do um, is to read the prospectus. Um, any 40 Act fund is required to file a prospectus. Um, and you can look at the funds, the funds fees that you'll be charged. Um, it's really important to understand what the fund is investing in that will be disclosed um, for either of those products and then also to understand the risks that the fund is taking on. Um, ETFs and mutual funds may have some similarities if they're both index funds, um, if they're you know from the same fund sponsor. So I think it's really important to do your research like you would for any other um, investment product. All right. Um, the next question, if any, is, is addressed to anybody that wants to, to chime in, uh, maybe we'll start with Charles and, and go from there. But um, since the question is this, since stock prices are low, is it a good time to use some home equity to invest in the market? I say no. Your home equity is really the equity you have in your house. And you have to think about what if you make the bad decision? What if you pick the wrong stock? What if the markets go down? Do you want to put your house in danger? Uh, for a lot of people, the house is their biggest form of savings. Uh, and so this is a place where you need to live in. And I just think in general, it's never a good idea to use leverage, whether you're borrowing on margin, you're tapping home equity line, or you're doing something else. Um, could you make money in the short term? Absolutely. And you might come back to me in six months and say, I should have done it. But it's not a question of whether or not you got lucky. The question is, did you do the smart thing? And the smart thing is not to put your house in jeopardy by 
by putting it to the stocks when you're uncertain what the outcome will be. Bob, do you have any thoughts that you want to chime in too? Oh, well, we were just talking about risk tolerances, and I mean, you'd have to have a very, very high risk tolerance to start putting your equity from your house into the market. I mean, you have no idea what the market's going to do. And certainly, as I mean, Charles said it as, as well as you can. I mean, you're taking risk with not, but the problem with a house is not only is it an investment, it's, but also has utility as a place where you live. So, I mean, the ramifications of, of losing the equity in your home is so high that I don't know that it, it, it's going to go above most people's risk tolerances. Okay. Uh, a couple more questions. Uh, what is the best strategy for deploying excess cash in this market, assuming all other assets you have are already well diversified? Anybody want to chime in on that one? Charles? You know, I would just say look at your asset allocation plan. Um, I mean, if you you could make the argument that if all your financial goals are meaning everything's on target and you want to have a small amount to play with. Um, I did use Cliff Aness, who's head of AQR, the big investment firm. And he uses the term sitting a little. If you have this excess cash, you want to sit a little, that's fine. But I think in general, just look at your asset allocation plan and stick with that because really your biggest long-term gains are simply going to come from being disciplined not trying to make these little strategic gambles here or there. Yeah, I would. Uh, the other thing is, it really depends on what percentage you're talking about of your portfolio, too, right? So some people employ it's like a core satellite approach where they have a very diversified portfolio of stocks and bonds international, and then they take a very small amount and kind of use it to try to enhance the returns by investing in individual stocks. Right? They're taking a little bit of extra risk, but with a very small amount of money. And so if you have some extra cash when the market's down, I know there's a lot of people, we were talking to John, um, John Stein, who's the CEO of Betterment, and he was saying that they've gotten lots and lots of new accounts because they have a lot of DIY investors right now that are, don't know what's happening in the market and they need some advice. But they've also have a lot of people that have gone to other platforms to try to invest in individual companies as well because of where the market is. So once again, it's a, it's, it's a risk thing, but no one should really be doing, you know, large percentage of their portfolio and things like that as well. Yeah. So um, two more questions. Uh, the first question I have is for Kathy. Uh, Kathy, um, someone asked the question about the problems of robocalls. And um, what is the what is the value of putting your name and number on the do not call list when they still keep calling? Is there anything that you know of that's being done to try to protect consumers from this, this plague of, of robocalls? A plague it is. Yeah, that's a great question. The do not call registry, which is run by the federal government, the Federal Trade Commission, is really important. Um, it used to be a long time ago when you'd put your number on there, it would expire after like three years. Well, they got rid of that rule. So it'll be on forever. Um, it doesn't mean a scammer is not going to call you, but it does mean that the calls coming through are probably more likely scams because legitimate telemarketers are very faithful about looking at that list because they can get into a lot of trouble if they call you and you're on that list. Um, and you can put all of your phone numbers on it. Um, you know, you sell your, uh, your home phone if you have a home phone still. Um, I think it, it is really important. And robocalls are, uh, they're, they're just through the roof. And, uh, Congress acted at the toward the end of last year. They uh, passed the Trace Act, which would require um, uh, phone providers to be able to authenticate where calls are coming from before they would let it get to your phone. So that if someone is spoofing or coming from a place that uh, that they say they are, like you know, they can use a Microsoft Store's phone number and spoof that, and it looks like Microsoft is calling you from that store but we know that those um, phones don't allow outbound calls. So that would be an automatic, um, uh, you know, stop the call from even um, uh, getting to you, or it would be flagged in some way. Uh, it's gonna take a long time uh, for that to really come into fruition. Um, so in the meanwhile, you know, just you know, use a blocker app if you have, if you have on your cell phone, um, you, can, you can ask your provider for ways to block them. Um, but they're a real scourge, and a lot of them are scams. And once you get talking to them, they take advantage of us. So it is a, it's a kind of scary place. 
Okay, thank you. Uh, so the, the last question I've got um, is, is one that I think that a number of folks on this panel would have great answers to, but given the low historical low interest rates right now, what role do, do bonds and bond funds play in portfolios today? Tina, do you want to start? We can kind of go from there. Yeah, and I think um, obviously the low interest rates are a concern, but you have to look at your um, your time horizon and your overall um, goals of your portfolio. Um, as older, we have a lot of older workers now in the workforce who are um, need to sort of move away from equities and more into bonds. It's sort of a natural rotation that's bound to occur. Um, so you have to assess that risk tolerance and you know, allocate your portfolio accordingly. Charles, do you have anything to add to that? Um, you know, the hard part is the interest rates are really low, but uh, and I can't remember who said this first, but um, bonds can give you the courage to invest in stocks. I mean, they're very low correlated, so they do buffer your portfolio. Uh, they are a source of income, um, and if people are worried about interest rates, they can they can ladder their bonds, meaning buying bonds to different maturities, or there's defined maturity bond funds, which actually mature on a certain date, and that kind of takes the interest rate risk out of the picture. Uh, but I do think you have to realize that bonds are really that cushion against stocks, and that's an important role they play in your portfolio, in addition to providing a stream of income. Okay, uh, do you guys have any advice for uh, investors to have conversations with their financial advisors, uh, with their financial plan re related to bonds right now? Um, Anna, do you have any thoughts at all about that? What should, what should investors be asking? I think we're having technical difficulties with Anna. Bob, do you have any thoughts about uh, bonds and, and what people should be asking about with the risks of that, given the, the, the low uh, interest rates? I don't, I don't think it's any, I don't think anything's just limited to bonds. I think, you know, when you talk to your advisor and you have a plan, you need to understand every single asset in your portfolio, what's the purpose of those assets, right? So you all, you have financial goals. You need to know why those assets are in your portfolio. What's the purpose of those assets? How do they contribute? to achieving your goals so that you can measure them over time, right? So you can make a determination of whether over time, whether they're actually achieving those goals or not. So like anything else that you want to talk to your advisor about, and I think, you know, people need to be really transparent and their advisors need to be transparent and, and investors need to get their, uh, ask the tough questions of their advisor among lots of things, fees, conflicts of interest. Um, but when it comes to assets, it's really about, you know, how do they fit in the plan, what the advisor expectations is, and you know, how they're going to achieve financial goals. And just to follow up on that, thank you, Bob. Um, you have to be very clear with yourself about what your risk tolerance is and what your goals are and when you want to achieve those goals. Once you actually have that honest picture with, you know, of yourself and have that conversation with yourself, then you can get into the details with your financial planner or other uh, financial advisor. Thank you. Thank you so much. So um, so if you haven't yet, don't forget to follow uh, us on social media. Um, there is other Alliance for Investor Education documents provided for your benefit this evening. Um, and you can find all three of the PDFs available uh, for download here within the GoToWebinar platform. And they're also available on the investoreducation.org website. Uh, Tomorrow, you're going to receive an email from AAII, which will include a survey link with questions about tonight's seminar. We'd love to get your feedback uh, for future planning for future events. Uh, if you've enjoyed the panelists and our content, please take a few moments uh, just to, when you receive the, the survey to let us know your thoughts. Uh, we thank you in advance. Um, and just in closing, uh, we, I, I would like to thank everyone, and we would like to thank uh, all the panelists. Uh, the American Association for Individual Investors for hosting us this evening. Uh, we had a remarkable turnout for this event. Uh, and now I'll turn it back over to, to Charles uh, of AAII to discuss some other upcoming webinars. Great. Thank you so much, Jason. Thank you, Bob. Thank you, Tina, Kathy, and Anna.
it's a pleasure having you all. Um, to attendees, thanks for attending um, to our latest in our Wednesday webinars. Uh, next week, we'll have Kevin Carter speaking about investing in emerging markets, uh, China. Uh, in two weeks, uh, my colleague Wayne Thorpe will talk about uh, one of our stock superstar strategies. And Craig Irosen, who's written many articles for the AI Journal, will be talking on June 17th. So I hope you're able to join us. We have more great speakers planned for later in the year. But again, thank you to all my fellow panelists. Thank you, Jason. Um, I'm glad we were able to get together and uh, put on this event this evening. Thank you, everyone, for attending. Thank you, panelists. The replay of the presentation will be available tomorrow on AI's YouTube channel. Links to the handouts and note shows discussed tonight will be sent by email address tomorrow. Have a wonderful evening. Thank you for attending.